Look at John chapter number 11. Thank you, Uncle, for that wonderful, wonderful song. John chapter number uh, 11. Stand one more time. Stretch. You've been on your blessed assurance for a little while. Some of you will get that. Some of you will fly right over your head. But uh, we'll look at John chapter number 11 and verse number 1. John chapter number 11 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Watch this in verse number 2. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment. And you read that actually in the next chapter, in John chapter number 11, how Mary uh, washed Jesus' feet with her tears, with that ointment, and with her hair. Now watch this. Go to verse number 33. The Bible says in John 11, verse 33, Lazarus had already passed away. Jesus was late. By man's standards, he was four days late. And John chapter number 11 and verse number 33, the Bible says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now I want you to notice this phrase that Jesus says. And he said, Where have ye laid him? Then uh, they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Now I want you to read the last verse we're going to read this morning uh, in our text. For our text, uh, as we stand, the Bible says in verse number 44. Or let's start in verse number 30, 43, sorry, 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he said, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews, which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Uncle Jim Kiabu, can you open us up in prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated this morning. Bethany was a place that was dear to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me move this too. Bethany was a place that was dear to the Lord Jesus Christ. As you study scripture, the Lord always retreated, if you would, to Bethany. And Lazarus was his dear friend. Scroll back. Uh, we're in John chapter number 11. Go back to verse number 5. The Bible says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So you see that the Lord had an unbelievable love for Lazarus, and it was described. Yes, sir. It was described there in Scripture. I also want you to see that uh, there was a remarkable thing for Christ and the Bible to say that Christ loves you. You know, the, the Bible describes John as the beloved apostle. The Bible says that Lazarus was not only the friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, but someone whom the Lord loved. And watch this, the Bible says Christ let him die. If you read in verse number 3, the Bible shows us that uh, the Lord knew that uh, his friend was sick. And the Bible says, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So the Lord knew that Lazarus was sick. And watch his response in verse number 6. And when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he had bowed two days still in the same place where he was. So yet knowing that uh, Lazarus was sick, he still stayed in the place that he was. Uh, he he still was. He was um, a little over 15 miles away. He wasn't too far, and uh, he still abode in the place where he was. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, "And then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead." He got to a place where four days he had known that Lazarus had uh, was sick and was about to pass. And he had the ability to heal Lazarus, but he didn't do anything 
about it. I want you to notice also in verse number 16, the apostles, not only Jesus Christ, but the apostles loved Lazarus. Um, I'm going to get Uncle Mingo if you can read verse number 16. So they were willing to, and they were ready to die with Lazarus. They were at a place where not only did Christ love Lazarus, but the apostles loved Lazarus, and they wanted to see him healed. Now watch, uh, not only was Lazarus someone that the Lord really loved and the apostles really loved, but his siblings really loved him too. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of siblings that could care less if their siblings died. Right? Uh, and notice the response of the siblings of Lazarus. Notice the response of his sister Martha. Verse number 20. When Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. So uh, Martha, when she heard that Jesus was approaching Bethany, she ran out of the house to find Jesus. She went by the roadside. I know in Molokai it's easy. You hear someone's coming to Molokai, you just got to go on Kamehameha Highway and you'll find that person that you're looking for. It's one road that will take you in through town, into the east end, into Mauna Loa. We pretty much have one road. And so I believe it's the same thing here in Bethany that the Lord uh, is walking on His way and He sees Martha from afar off. And Martha comes up to the Lord and says, Lord, where were you? Right? Look at this. Look at verse number 21. Uh, Sister Maddie, can you read verse number 21, please? No pleasantries. No, hey, hello, how are you, Lord? Oh, hey, uh, I heard you were in the neighboring town and uh, you didn't come out and see us. What's going on? Straight to the point. If you were here, he wouldn't have died. If you were going to do what you came here to do, see, seek and save that which were lost, if you were going to uh, be here as the healer and the great physician, my, fa my, my brother would not have died. And everyone thinks, well, uh, Mary did uh, you know, even better. She stayed in the house and kept her mouth qu uh, quiet. Watch this, verse number 24. Verse number 24. Uncle Jim, can you read verse number 24? Okay, so she, she, she knew, or she thought she knew, more than Christ did. Look at her response. She says, I know already he's going to rise. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. Thy brother will rise again in verse number 23. Uh, Uncle Jim, keep reading, if you would, in verse number 25, all the way down to verse number 27. Okay, she completely disregarded what Jesus Christ he said. Uh, what Jesus Christ was saying, he says, "Do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life?" And she said, "I believe that thou art the Christ. I believe that you should come into this world. I believe that you're the Messiah." But she didn't believe that God was life. That Jesus Christ was the resurrection and the life. And notice that the Lord tries to tell her everything is going to be okay. Now watch Mary's attitude in the whole matter. Verse number 28. Auntie Leanne, can you read verse 28? And Auntie Sydney, can you read verse number 29, please? We're just looking at the story, the overview. But go ahead, Auntie Leanne. Okay, her, uh, Mary's hurt. You see Martha's heartache, and then you also see Mary's hurt. Mary's hurt was more than she can actually bear. Her expectations caused her to have some disappointments. Uh, I want you to notice here, uh, Brother Bob, if I can get you to read. I want you to read verse number um, 32, if you would. Okay. 
Okay? So you see, both of them had the same response. Lord, if you were actually here, you could have done something that would have kept our brother from dying. You could have done something that would have kept our brother from falling into death. But since you were not here, our brother is gone forever. And Jesus turns around, and and this is where I have a problem with the whole story. Verse number 34. Watch this. Uh, Jesus, the creator of the whole universe... Jesus, the guy who made the heavens and the earth. Jesus, who knows every nook and cranny about your life. Jesus, the Bible says, who knows the numbers. He's numbered every hair on your head. Okay? For some of us, that's a lot of hair. Jesus, who knows uh, all of your needs. The Bible says that uh, his eye is on the sparrow. Okay? Jesus, who knows everything turns around to the sisters and simply says, where have you laid him? You say, Pastor, what's your problem with the whole, well, why is that the problem? This is my problem. Doesn't he already know? Why does he have to ask that? It's it's an irrelevant question. Why does he have to ask that? You know, I, I, I enjoy reading passages of Scripture over and over and over again when I don't understand them. One of them is in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number, uh, I think it's 34, the Bible says, or 32, the Bible says that Jacob was there and he wrestled with an angel. And uh, Jacob is wrestling with this angel and the angel says, let me go because the, the morning is breaking. I got to go. I got I to gotta skedaddle. I got to get. This is how we say it down south. I got to get. I got to get going. And, and I, he's wrestling with the angel, and the, the, the Jacob says, turns around and says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And what's the question that the angel of the Lord asks in that passage of Scripture? The angel of the Lord turns around and asks a simple question to Jacob. What's that question? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember? Simple question. It plagued me for many years. The angel of the Lord turns around and looks at Jacob and asks him, What is your name? What? Of all the questions in the world that you can ask right now, Lord, you know this guy. You created this guy. And you turn around and you, you ask him, What is your name? Because what, what does Jacob mean? The supplanter. The trickster. And and he wasn't looking to see what his name was. He already knew what his name was. He was turning around to ask him an underlying question. He was asking for a confession. He was saying, who are you? Is really what he was saying. And Jacob, he was waiting for Jacob to confess, to turn around and say, it's me, Jacob, the supplanter, the trickster. Jacob, who stole my brother's birthright. Jacob, the man who went in and stole my brother's blessing, who lied to my father. And so he was waiting for him to say, it is I, Jacob, the trickster, supplanter. And you say, how do you know that? Because the moment that he confesses, the Lord turns around and says, you're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're going to be Israel. Israel, a prince who will have power with God and with man. And so I started looking at this question and I started thinking to myself, man, he's not really asking, where did you lay him? You already know, Lord. So so what is he asking there? Church, does anybody know what the Lord is asking in this passage of Scripture? Anybody have a guess? Yes, Miss Lisa. Okay, Where, what do you think, Brother Bob? I saw you smiling over there. You have an answer, it seems like. I think, and I might be wrong, I like those answers, I really do. But I think the Lord looked at them square in the eyes, Uncle Mango. And I think he looked at them and he, they, they completely understood and he didn't want anyone else to understand. But he, he knew that they would know. And he asked them, where did you lay him? And they knew he was asking, 
where did you quit on me? Where did you put that dead carcass and say, well, it's over, he's dead? Where did you quit on me? I, I believe they came to a place where they had quit on God, and I believe that place was right at the front of Lazarus' tomb when they had rolled that stone over and they said, it's over. It's done for. But, 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 but let me assure you this. It ain't over until God says that it's over. It ain't finished. It ain't through until God says it's through. Now, I want you to notice that this is a place where they quit on God. Have you ever come to a place or thought of God failing you? You know, Job, Job was at a place where he thought, man, the Almighty, the Almighty, he gave me all of these things and he could have quit on God, but he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord right? Job could have come into that place where he failed, where, where he thought that God had failed him. Uh, my good friend, Pastor Cody Zorin, was here with us in August. What a great man of God. What a great preacher. Uh, he tells a story where he was preaching in South Carolina, and he got a call from his wife, and his wife, with tears running down her eyes, she calls her husband and says, Cody, you got to come home. Junior is really sick. Uh, he said his heart fell within him. He said there's, there's never a time where his wife would say, man, you got to come home. The, he, know his, he knows his wife would never pull him away from a meeting. He's an evangelist and he preaches all over the country and he's also a pastor. But uh, she called him and said, you got to come home. And so he dashes over and he heads home and a Sunday morning, instead of him preaching, he's at the hospital and the doctor said, your son doesn't have much time to live. Your son only has a few months, and, and so we got to start treatments right away to treat his sicknesses. And during that time, Brother Cody said that uh, he didn't know what was going on in his head. He was disheartened. He was distraught. He thought to himself, man, the Lord, you're taking away my son. But he trusted in the almighty hands of God, and God took him from it. I've come to a place, uh, and Brother Cody says this, we've, we're, not, we're not living right now in the sweet by and by. We love to sing that song. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Pa Brother Cody says, we're not living in the sweet by and by right now. We're living in the nasty now and now. And we're living in a, in a time where uh, we feel hurt and we feel pain. And we quit on God on some points in our lives. We think to ourselves, Lord, you should have done it this way. Or well, Lord, why didn't you do it this way? He asked them, where did you lay him? God, God wanted, wanted to ask them, where did you quit on me? Let me ask you this question. Have you quit in God? Have you quit on God in your expectations? Mary and Martha did. We just looked at those passages of Scripture where they expected Christ to be there on their timing. Uh, four days. They considered Him four days late. Uh, uh, there's an old southern gospel song that goes, He's four days late and all hope is gone. Lord, we don't understand why you waited so long. But His ways is God's ways, not yours or mine. Isn't it great when He's four days late, He's still on time? Isn't that a phenomenal thought? And they thought that He should have been there earlier, but God doesn't operate on their time. Uh, an old uh, old-time missionary story uh, Miss Elizabeth Elliot uh, wrote a book entitled Through Gates of Splendor. And that book talks about five men uh, out of Bible college decided that they were going to be missionaries over to the um, uh, Aku Indians, uh, Indians and the uh, Kuchaka Indians in Ecuador. And they decided that they were going to be missionaries in Ecuador. And they decided that they were going to give, the, give up their life to, uh, to Christ. So these men and their wives moved over to Ecuador. And they were missionaries over there. And what ended up happening, to make a long story short, those Indians who they were ministering to ended up killing the five men. And four, or the, the, the five wives were left widows over there. And Elizabeth Elliot turned around and uh, she looked to the heavens and she looked to the Lord and it seemed only, she wrote, it seemed only reasonable to me to say, Lord, if there's anything you want me to do about the Akas, send me. 
after her husband had passed away, after her husband had died. She stayed with the men who killed her husband, ministered to them, preached to them, to the point that they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the chief of that tribe turned around and said, My heart was dark like night, but Jesus, with His strong blood and Holy Spirit, came and washed it. These men came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. At that moment, at that time, her expectations were, Lord, my husband and I could minister here and win so many Indians to the Lord, but the Lord's will was for her husband to die and those people become soft-hearted to the gospel. And she's led numerous people to the Lord. And she's wrote many books that have helped numerous Christian men and women to be strong for the Lord. That book, Through Gates of Splendor, she wrote over there. Uh, that story was so compelling, the, the death of those five men, that it was even shown and broadcasted on, on, Mad, uh, 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 on Times Square in New York City after those men have passed. In, the, in national news, it was heard that their story rang all throughout the world how these men had given up their lives for the cause of Christ. But their expectation was totally different. They thought to themselves, man, it should have been this way. It should have been that way. I love that story in Scripture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you know what that story is about? Yes. Because I, what's that story about? They, they get cast into the fiery furnace, and the Lord saves them, okay? And the king says, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And those three boys says, our God can save us from that fiery furnace. But I, I want you to notice a phrase there. They turn around and look at the king, and they say, but if not, king, if our God does not save us from the fiery furnace, we will still believe in the God of Israel. What a remarkable thing for them to say, but if not, we're still going to trust the God of Israel. And they came to a place where their expectations was that God can save them, but if not, they were still going to trust God. You know what I want to encourage you to do, Christian? Your expectations might be a certain way. Your expectations might be, man, Lord, you should be doing this or you should be doing that. But I want to encourage you in knowing this, that your expectations might not be what God has planned or what God is going to do, but you should still trust Him. Second thing, where did you quit on the Lord? In your expectations? Uh, number two, where did you quit on the Lord? In your situation. There's a dead body here. There's a dead body here. Uh, they were at a place where they saw no way out. Notice the Red Sea. Moses, when he looked at the Red Sea, he faced numerous problems. The problem of the people's worry, the problem of the is Egyptians chasing them, and right in front of them was Moses, uh, or the Red Sea right there. They couldn't part the Red Sea, but God could. Uh, I could tell you their situation, there was no way out. But God made a way out. Number, letter number three. Have you quit on the Lord in your imaginations? You know, my dad, when he got saved and he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, he imagined it a, a, a certain way. He imagined that because his life was changed, that his family would follow in his route and, and, and that uh, his family in the Philippines would realize the change that Jesus Christ made within him and that they would start following his God. But for years and years and years, my family just mocked my dad. Every time my dad would go to the Philippines, he would sit still and everybody knew my father as a drunk. My dad was so bad, he would drink and drink and drink and drink. Uh, the only thing that would uh, clothe him in the morning was his vomit. He was a bad drinker, and, and everybody knew that about my father. And uh, After he had gotten saved, he went and visited the Philippines, and he would sit down as everyone was partying and drinking, and they would walk up to him with uh, uh, wine, his favorite wine, or they would walk up to him with alcohol, and he'd be sitting there, and they would say, Ramon, would you like some alcohol? And uh, before Christ, my dad, without any hesitation, would take that even if he would try to resist. He would try to push it on his own strength, on his own power, on his own might. But he couldn't resist that. 
After Christ, he would look at it and he would say, no, Christ saved me from that. And then his imagination was because uh, he was going this way that his family would, would follow, would lead, uh, lean towards the way that he was going. But for years, for years, they didn't trust the Lord as their Savior. I remember one time my uncle uh, June, we called him Uncle June. He was a junior. Pilagio was his real name. He was Pilagio Junior. My grandfather was Pilagio Senior. And uh, Uncle June, we called him, uh, called, and, and we were talk uh, my, my father and my brother were talking to him. <clears throat> and I'll never forget that conversation because my dad picks up the phone and is talking to my uncle. And he said, boy, you know, you could be religious. You could be going to church. You could be doing all these things. But that's not what saves you, June. He told my uncle, and my uncle was older than he was, and in, in, in as much respect that he was trying to be, he, he said in a respectful manner, he said, June, I want you to know that the only way you can get to heaven is trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, is knowing that Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, and you trusting that Christ can save you. And my uncle said, okay, thank you, and hung up the phone. And my dad wept and my dad cried and said, man, I, I thought, I thought in my hardest of heart that this was the day that he was going to get saved. A few months after, we were in New Jersey visiting my, my other uncle, my dad's brother in Pas Piscataway, New Jersey. And uh, we received a call from the Philippines that my uncle June had passed away. I'd never seen my dad cry like that. He started tearing up. He started crying. And we booked tickets and headed over to the Philippines. And, and my family did the same thing, you know, never thought anything of my dad. And, and they would watch my dad and they would offer him alcohol. And my dad would be there and he'd say, no, no, it's all right. I, I don't need any. Jesus saved me from that. The same answer he'd given for years. And my brother and I were there and uh, my, my uncles and aunts had certain expectations of who we, we are. But we went over there and... My brother and I just did the best we could every time we could to just talk about Jesus. We looked at my cousins and we would say, man, the Lord is good. What a beautiful day. We would talk about the Lord and how the Lord did such a miraculous thing in saving my father, such a miraculous thing in saving my mother that we were so excited to see our, our cousins and spend some time with them. And they saw the change of my father through my brother and I. To the point that my uncles and aunts were trusting the Lord as their Savior. To the point that my cousins were trusting the Lord as their personal Savior. For years, my dad had an imagination of how my uncles and aunts should have gotten saved. But the Lord had another plan. And the Lord said, no, this is how they're going to get saved. And finally, uh, I, I got to see my, my Aunt Gloria accept the Lord on that trip. I got to see my cousins trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. You say what? Our imaginations might be where we quit on the Lord, but, but, but don't. But don't, Christian. The Lord has a greater plan. The Lord has a greater plan. Let me say this. Have you quit on God in your declarations you might have quit on your expectations or your situations or your imagination but have you quit on God in your declarations if you read in chapter number nine the Lord is going around and he's healing people he's doing some great things I believe that there were apostles his apostles were there and were saying man look at the Lord Look at how, look at, this is the Messiah. Look at the great things that he's doing. And you read of chapter 9, the Lord going around and doing some great miracles. And then you read of uh, the Lord doing some phenomenal things. And I believe Mary and Martha were some of the ladies that were saying, man, this is my Savior. This is my Messiah. This is my Lord. And then you get to chapter number 11 and there's a dead guy in the room. You say, why? Because he couldn't heal him. You know, uh, I, as a young man, I have always talked about how good the Lord is, how good the Lord is, how good the Lord is. And I've seen a lot of people on the outside looking in, in saying, man, if your Lord is so good, how come He lets all of these bad things happen? You know, they, they, they probably quit on their declaration. They probably stopped saying how good the Lord is because they watched how their brother died. All of this time they're preaching and saying, man, look at the goodness of the Lord. Look at how He can feed all these people. Look at how He can take care of all these people. But they came to a place where their declarations, their preaching, their message failed them because the Lord, quote unquote, failed in this situation. 
Peter was one of those guys. Peter got to a place where uh, he had preached about Jesus and then once Jesus was taken away to be crucified, the Bible says that Peter followed afar off, right? Everybody remember that passage of Scripture? That Peter was looking from a distance and Peter was trying to follow the Lord and he gets into a fire and he gets into a place where he's communicating with people and he's just standing there and they looked at Peter and said, you're one of him. And Peter didn't want to be associated with the Lord because he had thought the Lord had failed. His Messiah, it was over. His Messiah was about to get crucified. And he said, no, no, I'm not one of them. What did he say? I'm not one of them. And they turned and looked at Peter and they said, your speech betrayeth you. You're one of him. He said, come on, guys. I'm not one of them. Three times, the, the, Peter turned and, and said three times to those people that I'm not one of him. Denied the Lord three times. And what, did, what happened? The cock crowed thrice. And Peter, all he could do was look at the Lord. And, and Peter knew that he had failed in his declaration of who the Lord was. You ever get to that place where you think, man, why? I remember growing up br bragging about my heroes. Bragging about, man, how great these guys are and how great these guys are doing serving the Lord and looking at them and, and watching how they had fallen and watching how they had failed and thought to myself, man, why? How could they have failed? How could they have done such great things for the Lord and come to a place where they had failed? Listen, Christian, there's a tomb out there where you threw in your situation rolled over the stone and said it's over I quit on you Lord there's nothing there's nothing Lord that I could do anymore so if there's nothing that I can do surely there's nothing that you can do and we put that stone in that place and Auntie Cindy the Lord comes over to that stone looks us straight in the eye and says don't worry where'd you lay him and the story doesn't end with Lazarus in the tomb. The story ends with the stone being rolled away and the Lord yelling out, Lazarus, come forth. I'm happy he said Lazarus at the beginning because if he just said, come forth, imagine all of the dead bodies that would rise, right? He turns around and says, Lazarus, come forth. And I can imagine this guy just in bandages like a veggie tail, right? Hopping over to the Lord. And the Lord said, unbind him from his bandages. They, they already looked at the Lord and said, Lord, he stinketh. He's rotten. He's decaying over there. Untie him from his bandages. I can imagine a little boy walking up to him and saying, okay, Lord, taking those bandages off. And Lazarus, <gasps> Oh, thank God. Guys, man, you got me out of here. I feel bad for Lazarus. He's always up and down, up and down, right? Resurrecting and resurrecting here and there, right? <laughs> but the Lord never quit on you guys. Don't quit on him. I had a time in Bible college where I came to a place where I quit. It was my last year, the first semester of my third year, my last year. And I remember thinking to myself, who cares about graduating anymore? I'm at this place where I don't even want to be here anymore. I remember sitting down at my friend's coffee shop. He owned uh, a coffee shop called Moxie Java. And I always got the back room. I tried to study and sit in there. And I would sit in there. And I was sitting there one day. And I was just trying to encourage him about something. And I was sitting over there. And I found myself discouraged. And I found myself wanting to quit and thought to myself, man, I'm going to go back going to go back to Canada, not graduate at all, just go back to working and uh, working my 70, 80 hours a week, even more, and uh, making money and just enjoying life over there. And I thought to myself, who needs this degree? I really just quit. I said, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be around certain people. I just don't want to be here anymore. And I remember picking up the phone and I'd given this illustration before and I said, Dad? I said, what? That's how my dad answers sometimes when I say, Dad? And he goes, what? He said, I'm quitting. He said, huh? He said, Dad, I'm, 
I'm quitting Bible college. I don't need that piece of paper. I don't need to be around here around these certain people. I, I, I don't want to even be here anymore. And my dad, without any hesitation, I'll never forget him on the phone. He said, okay, what the big CC? He started mocking me. He's, he's on the phone. He's saying, look at this guy who wants to quit. <laughs> I thought to myself, man, he's not even encouraging me. He said, I'll be there tomorrow with the U-Haul. Let me take some time off work. I'm coming now. Oh, that was a big baby. That's what my dad said. That's what my dad said. And he turns around, and he, this is what he does. He says, Grace, your son wants to quit. <laughs> Hands the phone over to my mom, and I said, Mom, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to be here. I just want to get out of here. I'm on speakerphone, and my dad's laughing in the background. And he said, what the, what the sissy? This is, this is my dad's line. What a sissy guy. That's my dad's line. When he thinks someone is a big baby or a quit or something, he, he always says, what a sissy guy. So that's what he started saying about me, and he started laughing. And I, I'm on the phone, and I'm telling my mom, and, and she goes, we'll be right there. I said, Mom, it's a 16-hour drive. You won't be right there. She said, We'll be there in 16 hours. My mom started packing up sandwiches, starting getting ready to leave. And she hung up the phone. She'll never tell you this. She hung up the phone and she prayed. And she said, Lord, whatever he's going through, you know the situation. Started getting everything ready. My dad started calling, getting ready to call work. My good friend comes into the room. And he, he looks at me. And he gave me a line that I had given him before. I said, man, I just, I'm just tired of it. He heard a little bit of my conversation. And he said, bro, you were the one who always told me, the Lord never quit on you. Why should you quit on him? And he turned around and left the conference room. And I'm sitting there with my Bible out, the computer and all of these things going. And all I, th all I could think of is, man, He's right. I called my mom and I said, you know what? I'll stick it out. And I can hear my dad laughing in the background, mocking me. Oh, the baby stopped crying. And I'll never forget May of 2015. That night, it was the night of my graduation. I was about to walk up, and I gave James a hug. I walked up to James, and I said, The Lord never quit on me. Why well, should quit on him? He smiled, and I turned around and went on, onto that podium, and I said, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the Lord never quit on me, and that I have this opportunity to graduate. Guys, guys. Where is the place that you quit on the Lord? And I want you to note that. That if the Lord never quit on you, why, Christian? Why should you quit on Him? Every head bow, every eyes closed. Uncle, if I, if I could get you to come up and if you could play a little bit of that song again. One pair of healing hands. I just want us to take a moment of silence. I'm not going to ask anyone to come up. I don't want you to come to a place where you you feel uncomfortable. This is an altar, and we know we have altar calls. And altar, the altar call is a symbol of um, when you give certain things up at the altar. You sacrifice certain things, and. And I just want you to come to a place where you, you speak to the Lord and you don't have to get up out of your chair and come to this altar. But I want you to spend a moment of quiet and of silence and just think about that. Lord, where have I gone off the boat? Where have I quit on you? Where have I decided in my heart that I'm not going to serve you or follow you? And I want you to come to that place and say, Lord, you never quit on me. I don't want to quit on you. Lord, you never quit on me. I don't want to quit on you.
Father, we're so grateful for this time to be in church this morning, Lord. We're grateful for those hands that bore those nails to bring us redemption, Father. Lord, I don't know what your people are facing here this morning. Lord, I don't know the situation, the trials, the pain, the heartache that they're facing. Father, but you know, we all have a Lazarus' tomb. We all have a place where we quit on you, Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you would rejuvenate us, excite us. Father, that we would leave this place and know that not only that you, you didn't quit on us and we shouldn't quit on you, but, but it ain't over, Lord. You didn't say it's over. It ain't over. And help us to remember those truths that you, the God of the universe, can still do wonderful, marvelous things this, today. Thank you for this service, Lord. Help us not to quit on you in our expectations in our situation, in our imaginations, and our in, in our declarations of you. Help us to be your servants. Help us to be encouraged to know that we're saved. Lord, you saved us. That's a miracle in itself. You've kept us this long, and you're using us today. Help us to trust in those one pair of hands. In Jesus' blessed and holy name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Just a few more things. If you would, please remember to sign up in the back for uh, the ministry or for the um, uh, church uh, directory or church uh, membership role. Also, social media. If you could check into church, that would be great. Let everyone know that you're here. And uh, lastly, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. We're going to meet for Bible study. We'll be studying the book of Ruth. You'll be, man, amazed to see the, 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 the wonderful things about the church that's found in the book of Ruth. So God bless you guys. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Aloha.